Um, so maybe we'll just start with a, a quick introduction. Welcome everyone to, I think, the last session of today, day three of our uh, conference week. As you guys all know, this is part of um, our partnership with the Education Students Council um, to do some professional development for us this week. Um, so we want to thank Erin much for uh, joining us today. Uh, she's going to be uh, speaking to us today about uh, this topic of environmental education. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be your moderator, moderator for today's session. So we're going to be monitoring the chat. If you have questions throughout, feel free to uh, mention them or raise your hand. As Erin mentioned, we'll kind of be monitoring there. Um, so, you know, don't be shy. Um, make sure to just keep your video audio off to make sure the recording goes smoothly. Um, and at the end of the session, don't forget to fill your uh, check for understanding form to make sure we can catch your attendance for this session. Uh, so without further ado, I will let Erin go ahead um, and Thanks, I look Karen. forward to the session. Um, so I'm Erin Much. I am the learning coordinator or a learning coordinator at Thames Valley District School Board. And my portfolio includes, um, it, for five years, I was environmental education specific K to 12. And then um, last year became environmental ed, science K-12 and experiential learning. And prior to that, I was a high school secondary uh, science teacher and uh, but biology and, and um, general science grade nine, 10. And so I'm gonna try to um, go through kind of what a school board can offer. I know many of you may not end up working in Thames Valley. So I'll try to provide some general um, context as well, but with our specific examples. So our board is fortunate to have three uh, environmental education centers. So Toronto and York have them as well. Um, Halton does theirs in partnership with their conservation authority. And that's one of our, our ways to really expand our opportunities is working closely with our conservation authorities. We have seven in Thames Valley that because we span 7,000 square kilometers, um, we work with seven, or I work with seven conservation authorities to provide environmental education opportunities to our students. But our three centers are board run with board staff. Um, the staff, many of them there are um, uh, Ontario certified teachers, um, but they are hired as environmental educators. So they are not paid as teachers and um, don't work the same job description as a teacher, um, but they will develop and deliver environmental ed programming at these three centers. And in London, we have Pond Mills. So if you have a student in London, you may have gone there. And then we had portables on Wellington Road and two years ago moved into Westminster Pond, which is next door to Reforce London. If you are from London area, that's where um, we are right now. And so just some of the program highlights, we offer year round programming um, right now. I am really sad that students are not getting to enjoy our equipment. So I'm trying to do some delivery to some schools in a COVID safe way that a school could borrow some snowshoes for a week and then we clean them and get them to another school. But normally they would, students would get to have a cookout um, with, with marshmallows and, um, and hot dogs that they bring on their own and do, um, do some learning kind of deep in a natural forest setting that many students don't get to do. Otherwise, um, our two sites have ponds where we can do pond studies as well. Um, and so this bottom left one is at Pond Mills. And I have a picture of a student, not this one, but where the um, one of the, he's probably six years old and, and was standing on that same dock asking, is this the ocean? And so just get, knowing that we're providing this opportunity for, for urban students who um, may never get to see the ocean, but they get to, to go to a place that they've never seen before here in London and maybe could return to. Um, so the top writers, some older students snowshoeing there. So we offer a range of programming across the curriculum to help support the embedding of environmental education into um, not only science, geography, and phys ed, those are the easiest three, but we also um, run some math trail programs, um, some literacy nature journaling pieces. Um, and then we started with a program called Nature School where um, in London, uh, there's a program called Museum School where you could go to say the, the um, Fanshawe Pioneer Village or the art gallery for a full week of, of experiential learning. And so we decided to offer a week long opportunity for grade four to six uh, that a class would come to the environmental center for all five days and that we would co-plan with the teachers what an integrated interdisciplinary week of outdoor learning would look like hitting on multiple curriculum expectations across the disciplines. And so teachers had to apply for it. We would only have maybe five 
spots at each center in a, in a normal year. And so um, the bottom one is students building or installing nest boxes that high school cut the wood for them. And then they got to build them in their class and they got to bring them to Van Sitter Woods and install the nest boxes while they were um, while they were out there on one of their days. And then the bottom right picture there is some of their um, hiking sticks. Uh, and the top left is an art piece where they were personifying some of the trees. Um, so these are just other pictures from our nature school model. Um, we really wanted to be growing that over the last two years because um, it's been really great PD for teachers and um, changing their pedagogy and making them more comfortable with outdoor learning back at school and interdisciplinary learning. Um, but COVID has hit and so we haven't been able to have students to our centers since last March. Um, and so instead our, our staff have been going to schools and running virtual programming. And so I didn't embed that in here because I hope that we'll get back to more of this model. Um, with, so this is forces and structures for grade five uh, nature school and, uh, and some of the, the community circle that they've got at the bottom there. And so one thing that we really help to support teachers is how will you then replicate this opportunity back with your class when you continue back at school? Um, how can you keep, keep this, go, this style of learning going? And so that's one of the things we talk about. And then we try to set them up with some community partnerships as well and consider where can you go beyond your schoolyard um, to explore. And so you can do an ongoing, our board has an ongoing field trip form where students would have permission to go within a certain bound area you have to make sure you still have the proper field trip ratio um, but then you could go to a local forest or creek or pond um, and do some exploring uh, there and so this um, document here community connected experiential learning really informed some of our work um, for the last couple of years um, it was a grant that you could apply for from the ministry and then it became part of the um, grants for student needs which is stable funding that well as stable as any government is but it's yearly funding as we know it uh, until it's not but we have yearly funding specifically for experiential learning and then for many more years before that even the ministry has a grant for outdoor education funding and so I manage that for our board um, and make sure to, to um, share it equitably and there's a process for teachers to apply for the funding um, and, and opportunities shared for which they could use it um, and so we're really hoping that we're supporting teachers not in a one-off opportunity field trip where they go to say Scribble Gardens or Apple Land, but rather that they have um, a broader experience and that the field trip is just kind of the culminating piece or the, the, the launch of a bigger project. So we are desi we design resources to support teachers for that in general and then provide examples of good places that they could go like with our with our partnerships with our conservation authorities. Um, and then in schoolyards, we try hard to support citizen science opportunities. So just this past weekend, over Family Day weekend every year is um, the Great Backyard Bird Count through Birds Canada. And so they, um, there's, there's um, sheets that you can use and we provide what the local birds that you might be looking for would be. Um, and then some other opportunities are Monarch Watch and then this is Nest Watch. So we often get high schools to build nest boxes for our elementary schools. And that can help foster some cross panel collaboration. Um, and then citizen science, if you're not familiar, it means that regular citizens are um, contributing real data to science and then professional scientists, I would still say our students are behaving as scientists in this case, but professional scientists who are making money to analyze the data, they would they are collecting all the citizen science data and using it um, to inform their research. And so you've got a multitude of information coming from around an area and can use that um, to form your next steps kind of. And so it's real world science opportunity. Um, and so we try as often as we can to be embedding citizen science opportunities into our environmental ed programs or to be supporting teachers to be running that at school. And so right now, one of the, the ones we're doing is this knowledge uh, project where students are measuring snow depth and temperature which this February has worked perfectly for. Um, so we can have, this is it here, great little grade ones and twos are gathering data in their schoolyard. So I got 20 kits from this knowledge um, and you can look them up uh, online if you'd like, but they, um, they sent me 20 kits with the thermometers and meter sticks for to give to the schools with data collection sheets. And then the, the teacher will upload that information. And then it gives, um, if many schools around Ontario are gathering the same data, I can give a picture of, 
of snow patterns that students can then go back and analyze themselves. And it's their data that they collected along with other students from around the same area. And they can look at patterns and start um, making some real world math connections and science questioning. Um, so this is feeder watch that just happened. Um, and so there's tally sheets that are made that are downloadable. And then um, we usually do a, a, a picture page of what you might see in your, in your feeder here in the Oxford, Middlesex and Albion counties. We share um, opportunities for indoor observation as well, depending on the weather. Um, and then the students and the teachers would enter their data and then they can start looking at um, some data around where they're from and start analyzing that. And so um, if we were in person, we could have a little bit of a discussion on this but in terms of curriculum connection. So I, I realize many of you are um, probably, you probably are a K to 12 group here um, with specialties in all areas, um, I hope. Uh, and so, and that you're interested in embedding environmental ed into whatever it is that you do, but what, um, just think for a moment, um, what curriculum connections for your favorite grade or the grade you envision yourself teaching um, with some of these types of opportunities and feel free to throw something in the chat if you'd like. Um, I'd love to, for it to be a little more interactive than me um, talking to my two screens. And when I'm looking up, it's because that's where video and the chat are. And then when I'm looking straight ahead, that's where my slides are. Um, yeah, so graphing for math in primary junior, um, tally sheets even, and then turning that into picto pictographs, data literacy. Yeah, that's awesome. Even looking at past data and then having students create their own questions from that and creating their own research question that they want to investigate further. Yeah, the life system in junior grades. Awesome. So this is um, some, some pieces of having students, even in terms of um, maybe in the arts, making careful observation, um, but then also similarities and differences. And then ecosystems, yep. And then um, at animal adaptations and design interactions is another piece, like a direction you could go depending on student interest and what grade that you're teaching. Um, and then having students uh, use this as an inquiry-based learning opportunity. So use student questions um, that they've generated in class with you and then start investigating uh, the answers together as a class. Some data management opportunities from simple to complex. So older students can make graphs in uh, Google Sheets. Younger students can color in tally charts. Um, and then as you get older, start learning about um, for in social studies migration. Um, measurement of distance and weight um, about biodiversity. So looking at all the different kinds of birds and, and, um, and, and why it's neat or what's different about them that we have so many varieties here. And then learning about design construction uh, in terms of nests, but also feeders. So you do a little STEM activity there about, about um, have them engineer the best feeder and then have them test, out, test them out in the yard with nut free seed. Um, and then some literacy connections. So these are um, infographics that, um, that older students could build their own infographic to be able to communicate either the data that they collected or um, how to build feeder. Um, this is younger students collecting their, um, their um, observations and then doing a little bit of writing. And then Nest Watch is um, where you can either monitor nest boxes or um, found nests that you find in the yard and students would monitor them ongoing and record. Um, and I'll tell you that grade uh, kindergarten students and grade 12 students and all of them in between will push and shove to be able to see into a nest box once it's open. Um, and it's exciting for all of them. And I've done this with population dynamics for um, grade 12 biology and then with kindergarten classes. And so students will monitor the nest is a quarter built, half built, fully built on their little recording sheet. There's one egg, two egg, three eggs, one has hatched, three has hatched. The uh, fledglings look ready to go. There, one's gone, three are gone. And, and all of that data will be put into Nest Watch. And then seasonal patterns of which birds are nesting where and when they're hatching is all being recorded by Birds Canada. So it's some pretty neat data. You can look up past information and then gather your own as well. So these are pictures from different schoolyards that students submitted a number of these actually last year during Learn at Home. We did a board wide um, bird watch where we had 22,000 entries of, of birds that students had seen over a weekend um, during our Learn at Home period. And then we followed up with a, 
a board wide nest watch. So these are some of the pictures that students submitted and we had them pin it onto Google Maps. And so those are all um, students own pictures are loaded onto Google Maps with a pin of where they saw it. Um, so this is just a STEM building activity where students are trying to replicate their own construction. Um, and so this is some of the data for Nest Watch and then getting into um, some of the older grades, more biology, but here's things you could do with birds for elementary science unit only, not social studies, not math and not geography, just science. These are some of the connections that we've been able to make. Um, so I just wanna highlight um, that birds are in every schoolyard and in every community. And so um, it's not something you have to buy, they're just there. And so uh, they offer a learning opportunity that is outdoors as well. And so one big thing with COVID this year, which we knew would, um, we were proactive and knew that come the fall when we returned to school that um, many more people would be interested in outdoor learning. And so over the summer, we created a number of resources to prepare uh, teachers for teaching science for two, teaching two of the four science units outdoors this fall. And so I don't think I've actually embedded that into the slides, but I can put it in the chat at the end during questions. Um, and then these are other Nature Canada um, citizen science programs, and then through the Toronto Zoos, a few more. So there's a number of them out there, um, just depending on where you are and what you have access to would be the easiest one to start with. Um, and then this is a, a way to do a bio blitz in your community and gather data. And it, that would be really nice to compare year to year as well. And so one thing, especially with elementary, um, but even secondary is developing a little bit of a protocol so that it is seen when you go out on the yard as um, that this is outdoor learning time, it's different than recess. And so having a few routines in place um, are helpful and it's nice to maybe create those with your students as well. Um, in Thames Valley, we have been working over the, like since 2014, to naturalize school grounds. And so um, if you've done, if you had placements in some of our schools, um, you may have noticed some natural school ground uh, climbers um, or benches or seating, outdoor classrooms, rock seating. And so um, that's something we've been working to provide a little more open-ended play rather than say a slide is a slide is a slide and that's all it can ever do, but there's a little more imaginative play and, and other, these are a little more cost effective as well for school communities who have to fundraise for anything um, on their yard. So these are construction projects. So uh, we start with a conversation with the school about um, what they uh, would like and why they would like it in terms of for learning opportunities and then start with a little bit of a design and we can have a design consultant who works with us and follow a fundraising policy and then um, and then it takes probably for a larger project um, a year or could be more depending on their fundraising capability at a school um, to, till we get to implementation. Um, another thing we support in our board is Ontario Eco Schools and this year they became Eco Schools Canada um, and so they have a number of free resources online um, available that are linked to the Ontario curriculum as well um, and so I um, so I think if you're interested in embedding environmental education into your classes, some neat projects as well as short lessons um, and campaigns too. So like sweater day or earth hour or uh, walk and wheel to school day. They have um, like the, the parent letter home and kind of what you could put on social media and all that together as one package of how to promote uh, these events at your school. Um, so they, that's a wonderful place to resource and those are the six categories um, that a school would get points in, in order to certify as an eco school and so before last year we had 44 of our schools as eco schools and then last year if schools were engaged in the process they were automatically just certified and then this year I'm not sure how it'll go because it's been challenging. Um, and so one thing we've done as a board is grade five classes that are interested we've pulled their electricity, gas, and water data from uh, facility services, and we'll compile, like I'll compile it for a class if they're interested, and then have a whole process of helping them use uh, an inquiry process to be able to um, analyze that data and really start with the student questions about what they notice about the data. So we put it in graphs, ask them what they notice, what they're wondering, 
um, and then what questions they have. And then we start figuring out who could we ask for those questions, who could we ask the questions of in order to get the answers. And so um, then we have them interview their custodian or they can write a letter to facility services to get other, other answers. Um, at one school, they were undergoing construction during their data, the data collection time. And so they wanted to ask questions of the um, of the contractor that wasn't finished yet, kind of of when the concrete was mixed, because they thought that one of the graphs showed a real spike in water, and they thought maybe that's when all the concrete was being mixed for the footings, which was pretty um, interesting that grade fives are pulling out some anecdotal pieces from numerical data, and so based on their observations of their school. So it's really great thinking exercise using their school as context um, for like a case study. And then at the secondary level, um, four years ago, we offered um, a program called Wild Wilderness-Based Interdisciplinary Leadership Development. And so we took, um, we took the first year 18 students up to Quetico Park, which is two hours west of Thunder Bay. And, um, and we did a whole course first. Um, I developed this as part of my master's as a, as a project and then implemented it. And we developed a whole course that was online for the first part. So students were at their regular schools carrying on with their, their four subjects in semester two. But in April, we started this online component to get ready for the trip. And then in July, went on a nine day canoe trip. We flew to Thunder Bay for some students for their first time on a plane um, or really away from home and then did a nine day trip and then um, come back and they have to do a final project as reflection and we took students who are grade 10 and up and then so we have gone three years and then we're supposed to go last year we couldn't and so moved those students to this summer and then also had to cancel this summer and so some of those kids will graduate and they won't have got the chance to go but hopefully we'll be able to um, continue on in the future. So as I just talk a little bit more about it, think about, because um, this is something as on any field trip, maybe one not as big as this, but consider how you need to manage risk for this type of an opportunity. And feel free to put in the chat things that you're thinking right away about risk before I, before I carry on. So what are some things that if you were pitching this to an administrator that you think that they would ask you or things you would need to worry about? And our very first year, um, that we went, we left one week after the drowning of the student in Algonquin Park uh, from Toronto District School Board. So our trip was all planned and we were ready to go and that happened a week before we were about to leave. And so um, that day there was a bit of a flurry of um, emails to me about a number of safety pieces and we had done everything that we needed to do and more and could show all that because we documented it already. And so that put a lot of people's minds at ease and then we were able to go and come back safely. But I know that while we were away that there was a lot of people um, thinking about us. Um, so I'm just gonna look, um, so first aid. So all of adults on the trip have um, wilderness first aid, um, proper training and co-creating safety rules is awesome. And so we did do that. We created a kind of behavior contract um, these students were selected, but by no means were they um, like the, maybe necessarily, some were, but they were not the like, top super leaders of and high achievers. Um, we picked students who were not achieving credits, um, students who could not afford the trip and really wanted to have um, a diverse group of students come on the trip so that they could learn from one another and provide this opportunity to as many students as possible. Um, and so our first year we, we wanted to take 18 and I think we only had 18 applications because it was a brand new program and, and we were just trying to get the word out. Um, and then in the years after that, we've had to turn students away, but we still try to pick them um, represent a number of our school or as many of our schools as possible, but then um, have a mix of grades and a mix of um, abilities and interests and academic abilities and kind of really represent the student body of the board, which is a little bit tricky. So, and we have all our students before we leave, we do two days of ORCA training. So they get their ORCA level one and their ORCA level two before they go. The adults, we are ORCA instructors um, dealing with the weather and season. So the weather is is the, the thing that I worry about because I can't control that. The rest of the safety pieces, I feel like I can have pretty good control over. Um, and so high wind is something that um, when we're out there um, and lightning are two things that I worry a little bit about all the time. 
um, the student to teacher ratio. So we have to have uh, one to eight, which works beautifully because on a campsite in Quetico Park, you can't have more than nine people. So that works perfectly for this setting. Um, we have lots of parents signature forms. So before we even go, we have to, um, we have to do a swim test for all the students before they can even do orca training. So we have a field trip for that. We have a field trip for orca training. We have a field trip for the actual trip. And so after our first year, I've learned to build all that together, all the paperwork and do it in one shot to parents rather than chasing students. Uh, communication during the trip. So our, in Quetico Park, their um, cell phones don't work after you kind of get into the park by lunch on the first day. Um, cell phones don't work anymore. And so after our first two years, we got a satellite phone that we just would have turned on if we needed to, um, but we didn't. So um, that you have to pay a yearly subscription for and then a monthly fee. So we just pay for it during May, uh, July and August, and then other teachers in our board are able to use it as well. Uh, so visiting the site before you bring students there is one part of the field trip policy um, that the teacher has to tra have traveled the route before. And so um, as, a, as a university student, I guided canoe trips up there. So I have traveled the routes and that's partly why we go there um, rather than a different park that I'm not as familiar with. And it's a true wilderness park. And so students are getting an experience where um, like high school students have not been teenagers without cell service for nine days ever in their lives. So they actually um, comment on, on how much they enjoy that, which is uh, against what most people would believe. But at the end of the trip, after our first year, part of the feedback we got was that they wish we hadn't given their phones back until later. So we've started doing that. Um, health and safety and site conditions. Yeah, so we don't know what the sites will look like until we get there and we sometimes have to clear and sometimes we have to push onto another lake if, um, if there aren't enough campsites because we always have had three groups. So we always would need um, at least three campsites on a, on a lake. So this is a picture from two years ago, one morning. And so we waited a little bit. This was very early in the morning. It didn't take long but the, for the fog to, to dissipate. Um, and so this is where we go. So Thunder Bay and then two hours further. Um, these are, we use um, this Voyager Wilderness Program as our outfitters to get all the equipment from them. And then they provide us with two wilderness guides as well. Um, if you ever get a chance to watch this documentary called The Canoe, uh, it's online. There's a part that I think um, might be the second like section um, is from the outfitters that we use. And she talks about their, the, the place in the program and um, but the whole thing is very good. It's only 30 minutes. So part of this was to um, to put into action or rethink secondary documents. So for those of you who are secondary um, teach looking at, at secondary at the secondary panel, um, I would, I would, re and if, when you're applying for a job, I would recommend looking at this as well as the global competencies. The ministry is now working to embed these global competencies, um, reframed as the, uh, what do they call them? transferable skills, um, and they're putting them right into the elementary curriculum. So they're in the math, um, and then this summer, a uh, team of us worked on refreshing the elementary science curriculum for the ministry, and um, we were highlighting where these uh, transferable skills, as they call them, fit into each of the overall expectations. So those will be in the new science curriculum when it comes out, which is not that different than the current science curriculum. Um, so this was part of our pitch of the course and how we framed it, that students learn in class and um, in class, which was online in spring and summer, and then they learn in the field in the summer and then fully online in spring. So the in-class part at the beginning also included the orca training, and we would go to growing chefs and make um, some meals like turkey or beef jerky and then muffins and um, granola bars, I think. Or no, lentil soup. And then we would, so the students would make that and they would see it that day as a group. It would be only maybe the third time they've met in person. And then we would package up another version of it and we would take that with us. So then they think that this lentil soup is like the greatest um, thing ever and they probably wouldn't um, eat it otherwise, but that they've made it themselves when they're out there, they love it. Um, so these were parts of what we were hoping students would learn. They all teach a lesson and they um, have to do a project after. They have to be leader for the day. Um, and they really get this pretty neat sense of place by learning from the geography and history um, and the biology of the area that we go to. And so they also do a little bit of reading beforehand in terms of leadership development. These are some of the books, either excerpts or some of them will read a whole 
one of these, the whole thing. Um, and then they speak to that on the trip as well and kind of reference it as part of their um, final project as well. And they have to do some route planning in Google Earth um, and they have to propose a route. And then we have a really, it helps them understand the scale of the park um, before we get there and for them to understand how far you could actually travel. Um, and so if the route is completely um, unfathomable, that's fine. Cause it's still it, that this part is about the learning. Um, and then when we're actually there, then they're following on the map and realizing kind of in real life where how far they had proposed or or that if you say, for example, are trying to travel from here to here, like that that would be maybe a five kilometer portage and you would never do that and instead you would paddle around. So those are things that if students who've never been on a canoe trip, which is most of them in this case, um, that's a brand new piece of thinking and learning and, and thinking in a different way. We have them do a sense of place assignment before they come and they have to choose a place that's special to them. Um, uh, it, near their home. So then they can start to think about how they would explain um, Cortical Park when they come back, um, which is really neat because they, they still find it difficult. Um, and then we do some meal planning and, um, and, uh, and thinking about equipment and stuff together as a group before we go. That's, those are my cinnamon buns. Um, and then they have to teach a lesson while they're out there. They have to be leader for the day. So this is us enjoying some waterfalls and sailing. Um, their orca level two and the meal planning at Growing Chefs. And uh, this was, we implemented bananagrams as a reflection piece um, during the trip and they all had to come up with one word. Um, so that's, that's not this one, but this was, they worked on building um, their own little uh, crossword with bananagrams. And then their final projects, which if we were all together, I would have time to show these, but this is for them. They have the, they get to choose the format. So um, this one on the far right with the rocks on it, a student created a reliquary. And then the one above that is a poster where she drew most of the elements of what she wished she had brought or what, what she had brought. Um, so students have created poems and videos and websites and letters to businesses about funding. Um, so they can choose the format, but it, um, it's a reflection piece about the trip. And so they, these are students who have come on the very first year. Um, we were fortunate to have a student from the first year return when using university as one of our um, additional, we had her come as a lifeguard for one group because the one teacher group didn't have their lifeguarding. So she was the lifeguard and then paired with the teacher. Uh, so these are our year three team group. That's, this is the third group. This is how we get to the outfitters. Um, these are student photos. This is part of the history is that the, the group that owns the outfitters are Métis and they do a really neat um, history piece before and after about the fur trade through that area and through Canada. Um, so students have to apply with a parent portion, a student portion, and a reference letter. Um, and so um, one thing that we're that I mentioned before is we're really careful about equity and so um, of of the opportunity, um, and have and are very careful in our selection. And it's very difficult now that we have more students who are interested. Then a second secondary program that we're running is our environmental leadership um, program. We call it the HELP program for the head, heart, and hands approach to our environmental leaders project. And so that we have an ELP program and other boards do as well. Um, ours was a grade 12 version and it was at East Elgin Secondary School. So it wasn't accessible to all students. And so this program is for grade 10s and any student from around Thames Valley can apply. And so we've had, this is our third year. We have 23 students um, from across the board. So par parents are driving their kids in from Park Hill and Glencoe into London right now only every other day um, for this because they've been selected for this program and then for next year we have uh, 50 um, full applications in so I'm just working with our superintendent right now to hopefully run um, a semester one and semester two program for this and so um, one of our big goals for this is that the students are at Westminster Ponds which is like 300 um, acres of of uh, forest in the center of London, right by Victoria Hospital, um, and that we're getting, giving these students really place-based education and we're getting an interdisciplinary approach. We're getting four credits. Um, so um, these, this is our first year group and this is kind of our target audience is kids. So really it's for anyone. I hope you can see, kind of gather that 
um, in the in the ex explanation there. Um, this is where our classroom is. So this, if you can see my mouse, this building is there is where the classroom is, and they have access to all of this uh, trails and the ponds. And it's right behind the Parkwood Hospital. Uh, in a normal year, they would have the opportunity to work with younger students who visit the environmental center as part of our Thames Valley programming that our environmental educators run. So they would partner up with the HELP program um, on, we had it working on Wednesdays. Um, but then they also get to work with our conservation authorities and urban roots, um, Reforest London is next door. They'll be designing this year, they'll be designing programming for the Children's Water Festival, but it will be virtual this year. And same with the Forest Festival was this fall um, with our great partners, uh, conservation authority partners. So these are some of the projects that they got to work on in person. And this year they'll work with these community partners in a virtual setting. And so far it's going um, pretty well in terms of the partners still have good projects that the students can work on. The partner can meet them through um, Zoom or Google Meets or Teams to explain the partner's need. So they earn a credit in civics and careers in English, um, applied or academic. So it's a de-streamed program already. Um, and this is students talking about the program on CBC Radio. Um, they get the phys ed credit that was at Bowler Mountain. Um, they go, they've been snowshoeing a few times this year already. And then an interdisciplinary grade 11 project. Um, so these are some of the projects they've worked on. Um, and then uh, they uh, would still do the literacy test like a normal grade 10, not this year, because you don't have to. Um, and normal evaluation reporting process still happens. So they're tied to one of our high schools. Um, they have to get their own transportation there. And they, it's the same as the other program where they have to apply. Um, and so they quickly form, because it's four credits um, and they're with one teacher, they quickly form a pretty tight group, which is nice to see, especially right now during COVID. Um, so these are some of the partners that work with this class. I'm just going to check the time. Okay, I'm trying to go fast here. So what we're really trying to do with these this group of students is provide them an opportunity to develop some really great skills. Um, so to about a list, of, there's um, 23 because we have to. Um, so in grade 10, so and this is a good piece, I think, for you to understand too. So class sizes um, when you have a mixed. Um, you have to go with this, the lower amount if it's applied in academic. And then because it's mixed, you have to also drop 10%. So our class cap size, I think is 23 or 24, um, rather than like say 30, which works well. Um, and then this year, it's I think it's kind of nice that they've got the two cohorts. So um, they have a, a small group of 11 or 12 each day. And then um, the teacher, Jen, has them, the other cohort joined by Google Meet for half an hour during the day. So whoever's at home is still joining the class for either a guest speaker or a community circle. And then they're doing the rest of their work on their own. But instead of doing study hall at the end of the day, which is our secondary model right now, they're joining part of the class with us all together on a big like view sonic screen as though they're sort of in the room. Um, which is best we can do right now. Um, and so how, so for this, just something to think about um, to ensure that the process is equitable. Um, so some of the pieces is that, that we've had to consider is that the online application, it's a Google form, it goes out all guidance, um, but then we were realizing not always did all students know about the opportunity so so last year we started using school messenger which is the board system of passing an email to parents and so the board can do that for whatever they want about COVID every day if they like but we used it to target so that all grade nines their parent or caregiver received a message about our information night for the program last year and we did it again this year the same way just the day before we shared it through the schools and like social media and everything the normal way first and then the day before we share that this information night is happening tomorrow we want to make sure you know about it and so we had to run our information evening virtually of course this year and so we had a and that did make it I think easier for people to attend so we had 130 um, people come to an, an online information night about the program and then ended up with 50 full applications where the students had two reference letters one from a teacher, one from somebody else, a parent portion of application where the parent has to describe their child and why they want them to be part of the program. And then questions from the student, including a student video. And so 50 students had all of that together. Um, and so then we're just trying to now accommodate two classes, which has a lot of implications behind the scenes. Um, and so it's 439. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and those are just some of the programs that we're doing. I didn't get to, I didn't include lots of the partnership projects like the water festival and the forest festival that we do with our community partners. And we usually run maple syrup festival right now. Um, if you've seen the fish on the fence at any of the schools, that's with our conservation authority as well. It's called Stream of Dreams where the whole school gets to participate in that program. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Um, and then I can see if people want to put their hand up and ask a question or put it in the chat or feel free to turn your video on. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was um, alternate field placement. Um, and so typically we would take um, to have students at our centers to join our environmental educator on a field placement. This year we're going to have one joined Jen with the HELP program. Um, one is going to work with our environmental educators like kind of in some virtual programming that they're offering. And then I just got another one. Um, so I'm just wondering if we maybe put two with Jen with the HELP program and one can one Alto student can support some online pieces and one in person and they can kind of flip flop. But we're always open to um, supporting students who are interested in environmental ed as like part of their teaching practice later and have them come to our centers. And in an ideal, um, non-COVID time, we could have one at each center, um, which are um, ones in Woodstock, ones in kind of between St. Thomas and Elmer, and then one in London. So I'm happy to answer any questions. So I think we've got one question in the chat from Melissa, and I saw Haliz raised uh, their hand. So uh, maybe we'll start with Alyssa's question. How many students are in the HELP class? So that's 23. And then the wild program is we run it through the board. So um, like it's a system program. So I am the teacher with one of our environmental educators and then usually another teacher in the board. And we brought a different one each year. Um, and so the so students can apply for the wild program um, and then they come with us and we run it through Weeble, which is our um, adult ed and alt ed summer school where summer school runs. And so it runs as a summer school credit. Um, and yeah, we've brought three different other teachers each year. Um, the AFE opportunity, I think they are because that's how I think these, uh, I'm pretty sure that the emails that came to me said that they, that's where they saw it on the teacher candidate blog that, um, that they saw that working with our environmental educators was one of the um, field placement opportunities. And so if, to go about starting wild program at your school, if you, um, Emily, end up working in a different board and you that's something you want to pursue, I'd be happy to uh, talk you through um, a lot of logistics, but how to get to, yes, maybe at your board, if it's not our board already. Um, and then, so, okay, so how did I get involved in where I met? So as a universe, so when I was a teenager, I went on a trip just like Wild, um, organized in London, and it was at the same place. And so then, in grade nine and then I ended up working there in grade 11 and 12 in the summer and then I guided for them in university and um, so having worked there as a teenager I chose to go to Lakehead and do the outdoor ed outdoor rec program that was combined with natural science so it was a double degree program which was appealing um, so I did that at Lakehead and came back into teachers college here um, and then I did my master's at Queen's but teaching here I had said when I went to teachers college I didn't want to teach in the classroom um, but then once I did my first placement, I really liked having my own class of kids and knowing my students really well. And I started coaching. Um, and so I really loved the school I had done my placements at. And then I ended up getting better there. Um, and so I taught biology and science. And in the first couple of years, I taught French and business and family studies to, to, to be able to teach there. Um, and so I taught there. And then um, this position the person who was in it. So um, a coordinator position for a school board is a four-year position. And so I knew that this, the person, it was coming up, their term was coming up. And so I applied for this position um, seven years ago and then reapplied when it came up again and, and was hired again. So I'm still here. So certifications and training. Um, in terms of doing a trip like WILD, there's a lot of certifications, but to just, um, be um, to do environmental ed at your school, um, you don't need certifications, but to go on a big trip, you would. Hope that answers your question. There, was there a hand up too? Did you say I don't? I don't. There's too many squares. I don't see the hand. I believe they posted their question in the chat. Okay. Yeah. 
I think um, one person is wondering um, just more clarification about the AFE. I think you mentioned something about the teacher candidate site um, or so other opportunity. So it um, so it is working with us is posted there. And in terms of other opportunities related to environmental ed, I'm not sure it, what's posted there, but um, I would consider reaching out to um, Growing Chefs, the Conservation Authorities, um, and the Children's Museum, and Museum London as well, because I do believe they all take um, teacher candidates for the alternate field placement. And if they don't, they would be excellent places to do. So any of our conservation authorities have wonderful um, education departments. Some are small, some big, um, but they're all good people and um, are doing great things for students. And so it does give a different perspective on education. And you also might be able to lend um, a bit of a curriculum piece to some of them. So we, um, with, our with our community partners, they're all so great to be able to um, consider like what are our needs as a board and so for example upper Thames I can sit down with them and say we're really focusing on assessment right now I really want whatever students do with you to be for them to have an opportunity to self-assess and then they'll help design um, those pieces or if I say you know we're focusing on the global competencies right now those are that's the buzz right now in education then they'll highlight the global competencies as part of their programming so um, they they're really responsive to work with us because it's a great partnership where they, um, we can fund program um, through them and then they want to design exactly what we need. And so we have a really great uh, grade eight program happening with Upper Thames right now. 17 classes are going through this green process. So you could look up um, GM Green and that's um, the conservation authority meet with the students five or six times and go through this whole um, action project planning where the students are identifying issues in their own community and then developing a project and a solution to the issue. Um, so they're doing it virtually now. They've pivoted and they're joining by Teams and Meet, and it's pretty great. Um, a list of resources. Yeah, so I um, should, what I should do is post some quickly into the chat. I need another, I need a third screen. I'll, I'm going to post our field guide for outdoor learning that we created in the summer in the chat. Um, because it has uh, a lot of things linked to it. So if you don't mind giving me a second. And also in the summer, I put a team of teachers together and they um, developed, actually, I'll just show you the website right now. And we've got a bit of an anecdote. It sounds like somebody has been involved with the ELP program with- Oh, Eastbound. right, Alyssa. So oh, that's great. Shout it out. <laughs> so this website, I had students, um, or not students, teachers. One of my screens is touch screen and one is not. <laughs> It's not going to work if I touch the wrong screen. But this website um, we created as a resource this summer. So I pulled, um, we pulled 32 teachers together um, to develop these science units. Um, and so if you look at them, so it's in the chat now, but if you look at them um, by grade, so you can go to say grade five, then we did um, two of the units and they're all for outdoor. So it's how to do your conservation of energy unit outdoors. And so um, they're both, they're little slide decks so that they're kind of like a, a book um, with lots of hyperlinks, but with assessment opportunities, um, how you could tie it to at home learning if that happened or how you could tie it to, um, to uh, inside the classroom. So these are say the 10 lessons. So then it's the full lesson is there. And then um, followed by related to another curriculum so that you can be interdisciplinary and then related to what students could do at home if you were in a hybrid model or learning got moved home, which has happened this year. Um, and so the curriculum connection and then day two. And so we've done that for every grade, um, but then we also, I pulled a different team of teachers together because there was stress about phys ed and that they weren't gonna be allowed to use the gyms in the fall um, and all phys ed would be outdoors and it was in the fall. And so um, this 
amazing team of elementary phys ed teachers um, we put together, we called it our playlist of outdoor phys ed. And so it's COVID friendly phys ed activities where students don't need to be near each other and they're not using equipment that they would all be touching. And so this is, I think it's like 130 slides of, um, of uh, phys ed activities um, to, and organized by the curriculum uh, major strands. So that's how it's organized. Um, and it's for kind of all grades. We, uh, we put kind of the ideal grade on there, but um, I would say um, you could go there for elementary, but there's lots you could use for secondary as well. So that's our, that's our um, resources that we scrambled to develop um, and worked really hard to create over the summer and then came into the fall a little bit tired. But, um, these are, and then we have two charts of outdoor learning opportunities that we created all, all through the spring learn at home period, we had to develop um, uh, five lessons a day for outdoor learning and five a day for five a week, oh, sorry, like five per week for the 10 weeks of learning at home for every grade for um, outdoor learning and for science. And so then we compiled them into a spreadsheet because it was a lot of work to do and we put them all here. Um, and then this is how to build a math trail at your school. It's a template that you could download um, and then this links to our other environmental ed sites. So now that you have this site, it kind of links to a bunch of good resources that we've created. I'm just gonna go back to the chat now. Oh, thank you. We tried to make it pretty too, because we really did want of teachers to feel excited about coming back to school in September. Um, and that they were, they felt ready and supported by the board was what I really wanted them to feel like. And that they were, they were jumping into something exciting and not that they would be nervous to come back. Um, so we tried to think of everything in the summer. Yeah, so the gym, the phys ed resources, I, my friend was the phys ed coordinator. And so I, that's why I caught myself to not call it gym. And so, because the gym is the place is what she told me, but the, the course and curriculum is phys ed. And so the phys ed playlist is, uh, is linked right here. And so the, I shared this link of this website with you and all of these are linked into it. And all of the links are set to anyone with the link can view, not just Thames Valley. We kept it for the first two weeks of the school year as, um, as only our board could see, because we wanted to catch any thing that we maybe needed to fix. And then many other boards were asking for access. So then we made it public. We had to go and change all the link settings, but we made everything public so that um, my colleagues at other boards could share with their teachers as well. Um, okay. There was one question it, earlier, Erin. Um, they're wondering if there are generally uh, the same type of outdoor education projects or learning coordinator roles like this in other boards outside. Yeah, of so um, I have a colleague at, um, at um, York, who has a similar role to me. Um, and then today I met with, um, like we have a provincial steering committee for Eco Schools, which has a lot of people like in this role who meet together. And then a steering committee for OASBO, which is um, more the facility side. Um, but because I'm involved in the school ground greening projects and energy stuff that I sit on, on the environment and sustainability committee for the school board um, organization as well. And so a lot of people in that group are part of their facility services, not the learning support services that that's where I sit. And so um, because I bridge both, but I'm far more on the learning support services side, I bring a different voice to that group of facilities people. And so I learn lots from them. And then they ask lots of how could you implement this as curriculum? And how can we offer this as student like learning opportunity? Oh, you're welcome, Emily. So I'm happy to, to answer any other questions. And if someone wants to turn their microphone on too, I'm happy to hear voices. I am just, uh, you can probably tell, I probably should have had more to drink today. I was presenting a couple of times earlier today as well. And so um, I've been talking lots. So I'll put also, um, I'm gonna put my email in here at the end and then, um, Teachers use Twitter, you know, um, kids use Instagram, but teachers use Twitter to share teaching stuff. Um, so I always say it like Facebook's for family, Twitter's for teaching, and then Instagram's for like friends, whatever. But um, so I use a Twitter account to share what our teachers are doing in our board. Um, so I put that on there as well. Thanks for sharing about that, Erin. I think there was another, um, someone who wanted to learn about other partnerships that may be possible or, you know, other ASD opportunities perhaps. 
Mm -hmm. I think, um, so I would say the conservation authorities, the art gallery, the children's museum would all be good places um, to ask. We've, I've done lots of um, fun partnerships with um, our arts coordinator and working with Museum London, the art gallery to do some outdoor and environmental pieces. So this year their theme is, um, is nature. And so the student art exhibit normally would be showcasing our student art, but they uh, students submitted their pieces and then we um, adjudicated them and they, they all went to the art gallery and I think were photographed and there's gonna be a big digital um, gallery of the student work this year so the of the under the theme of nature and so one of the schools uh, one of our secondary schools central their pottery class created bird houses that looked like uh, so centrals in in old north in london and so or downtown but they created the bird houses look like homes in the central neighborhood so it was a real like sense of place opportunity the kids had to walk around like really experience the neighborhood and learn that and then um and then they replicated these homes in pottery to create birdhouses, which were just like beautiful. Um, is it difficult to coordinate game permission for building projects in outdoor school spaces? Um, okay, so uh, this year, I, our, our secondary um, new superintendent is very keen on our secondary students being able to build pieces and our facility services, their job is to ensure safety. And so, um, so we had, a, I coordinated a meeting between us that we could create some parameters under which secondary students could do some building like planter boxes or um, some seating for outdoors that then um, they could have at their school or that our elementary students could have. So swings that'll probably never be allowed because you would need like an engineering stamp and people would be too nervous about the safety, but picnic benches, yes. And even our secondary school, B. B. Davison built welded um, picnic benches for the factory, which is like a kind of big fun place. Um, so our, if our schools can create things for industry that people are buying, um, they're, I think, good enough quality for our schools. So we've started creating process that students can be building and then, um, and then our elementary schools could be uh, on, on the receiving end of some of those pieces. And then through the experiential learning funding, I'm able to supply funds for um, construction. So I can pay for the secondary school to build the planter boxes and the elementary school can just have them. And the elementary students get to understand that pathway of those courses and that the tech courses exist at their school and that the secondary students are supporting the community. There's less likelihood that they're being vandalized later. And there's a lot of good pieces in, in connecting the elementary school to the secondary school. So that's something I'm excited about this year, trying to make the most of some that we can't spend money in some ways and trying to look for other creative ways of doing that. I put the zoom up high again, so that's why I'm looking up. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I am super grateful to have the opportunity to share all of this with you. Um, I hope you can tell I do love <laughs> um, this work and um, and I feel it's good value to our, to our students to have um, an, a different and exciting and engaging way um, to learn when they come to school. Um, one of our operational goals is the eight out of eight credits for secondary. Um, and I do believe that school needs to be a fun place for our students to um, and, and have engaging learning opportunities if we want them to get eight credits. And so it's kind of an intangible, it's hard to measure um, this value, but I do believe it's really important. You're welcome. Yeah, just, uh, I know we're nearing the end of the hour. Uh, thank you again, Erin, for this very informative and uh, I really enjoyed the pictures, uh, to be honest, to see all the green and, and outdoor stuff. Uh, but we'd like to thank you again for your guidance and um, information and hopefully everyone here enjoys the rest of their conference week so uh, maybe we can just hang around for a few more minutes if there's any additional questions but otherwise sure. um, hope everybody has a great rest of the day